This story takes place in August of 2013, in the mountains of South Oregon. I am a USAF Security Forces Airman, in other words, a military policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick and I decided to go exploring some back roads and get out of the heat in town. South Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used, and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days searching on roads that we knew, finding roads that we did not, and driving for hours into the mountains. Eventually, navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road that we'd never been on before, and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for about an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of any other people in the woods. We rounded a bend into the thick fir woods, and emerged into a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noises, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, Right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange, and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the Aspen Grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees, as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5 foot 5, but regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed that he was looking back into the Aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of colour that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small, one-man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet away from this strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread hit me, and felt certain that there was someone in that tent, and if we could see the tent, they could undoubtedly see us. There were no campgrounds in the area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely, someone camping so remote would be, well, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement, nor hear any strange sounds coming from it. Nick suggested that I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? There was no reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area. But we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in that tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it just the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the campsite, should there be any need to leave in a hurry. He would be waiting at the wheel, my heart pounding. 
I started walking through the trees towards the tent. I was totally keyed up, with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, and no wood collected. The tent, oh the tent, it was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave to tell Nick what I had seen. As soon as I left, I heard Nick begin to yell, Let's go, let's get out of here! Not knowing what he was yelling about, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat up old Ford Tauros on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat, and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men, and the third person was laying against the window of the back seat. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way that we'd come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still don't know if the person in the back was male or female. I called the state police and they promised to send a trooper out to check the scene. I received a call the next day from the trooper, stating that the campsite and the backpacks and all the women's clothing was gone. Though he could tell that people had been in the area, the strange table was still by the thick aspen grove, and I have not returned to the area, and do not have any intention of doing so again. I live in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in northeast Georgia. It's really beautiful with hundreds of miles of national forests. There's some great state parks and a ton of fantastic camping places. Unfortunately, my hometown is also relatively poor. While there are some out of town residents from Atlanta and other places, a lot of people where I live are really poor. I do freelance work as a technical writer. I do most of my work online. If I didn't have that, I wouldn't have much going for me. If I didn't have this, I would literally have to move somewhere else. It's one of those small towns that will rob you of your ability to accomplish anything in life if you stay there for too long. Excluding a handful of doctors and lawyers and Georgia Power Company employees. The only employment in the area is a Walmart, fast food joints and a couple of grocery stores. To the east of my town, there's some massive national forest. It's loaded with great camping sites and lots of relatively unused hiking trails. I really enjoy hiking on them with my dog, though to be honest, it's pretty unnerving most of the time. There's no signal for literally miles and it's about 10 miles away from town. In the past, there's been lots of vehicle break-ins in the trailheads. The gravel parking lots also are usually filled with litter and broken glass and whatnot. I'm guessing from car windows. There's usually really dodgy people hanging around these trailheads or just driving around on the forest service roads. There are really rough roads too, and you'll see these beat up $500 cars just barreling along the roads for maybe a moment of joy. All that being said, it's actually a great place to go camping, however, you have to be very careful. A few years ago, a couple of my friends and I decided to go playing paintball in the national forest. It probably wasn't legal, I know, but we decided to turn the paintball expedition into a camping trip so that way we could play the next morning as well. After a pretty uneventful day of shooting paintballs at each other, we drive a couple of miles to one of the more popular camping spots. Unfortunately, a church group or something had taken up all of the spots in the area. This was really the only camping spot that we were familiar with, and it was pretty great to get to. It was getting dark now, so we decided to keep on looking, so we decided for about an hour or so further into the woods. 
by this time. It's a bit dark and we're getting a bit worried about finding a spot. We all had GPS on our smartphones but none of us had any signal. Wasn't really surprising to be honest. We then turned onto a road that really wasn't in very good shape. It had a broken metal barrier laid in the woods nearby. That being said, it looked like 4x4 vehicles had been going over it continuously. Now our F-150 actually had a pretty high clearance so we managed to get over all of the dirt mounds. There was an old gravel road on the other side and the other road was pretty much clear of debris. We went on to this one. We drove down that road for a few miles and we eventually come across a small creek. There were some blue traps hanging over plywood nailed to a tree. It kind of looked odd. That said, it was pretty much dark at this point and we didn't want to keep on driving around all night looking for a good camping spot, so we left the truck light running and set off our tent. As we are about to set up the tent, we noticed that there was a lot of trash in the woods and surrounding area. I then noticed that there's some green bottle on the floor. After looking closer I see that it's insecticide. I was really tired at the time and I just thought somebody had been dumping their home garbage out here but none of us were weirded out at the time. There was nothing too bad about it, or so we thought at the time. So we set up camp, had some beers, chilled for a bit. By this time, it was probably about 11pm, and just as we are eating, we noticed that there's a weird faint glow from the other side of the hill. At first, we were convinced that it was a moonlight filtering its way through the trees. However, the angles didn't make sense. It seemed to be a bright light and it wasn't moving. It was kind of like the glow you see over a bright city and we couldn't find out what the light source was itself though. Since there was no other access to the area, we decided it was not campers. The hill was about a quarter of a mile from our campsite so we decided to investigate. Under any normal circumstance we wouldn't have went but we had some alcohol in us and two of us, Jacob and I decided to take a look. My other friend Isaac decides to stay put behind and just put some popcorn on. We started walking towards the light source and the situation gets even stranger. All of the trees in the area have their bark knocked off in a circle around their trunks. We thought it could have been the work of a beaver that lived in the creek, but it seemed strange that a beaver would go around doing this in a circle. Jacob and I started talking about the ghost beaver in pretty loud voices due to our fear and drunkness. As we're almost at the top of the hill, Jacob trips up and lets out a yell. Only seconds after he does so, the light, whatever it was, went out. We then looked at each other and decided that maybe we don't need to see what the light was after all. We walked back in silence, looking back every so often. We decided to turn off our flashlights and just use the moonlight to navigate back to our campsite. When we're a couple of hundred feet away from the campsite, I can see my other friend Isaac walking around the campsite. He was wearing a hooded coat and I hadn't seen him wearing this before. For some reason, he's carrying his paintball gun. This is a little odd. We said to each other, the fire had started to die down and we couldn't see our campsite very well. At this point, we've probably been gone for almost an hour. From the distance that we were, it looked like Isaac was looking at something further off. He kept walking around the site and peering in the tent. When we got back to the campsite, we saw Isaac walk up to the road that we came in on. We figured he was going to use a bathroom and didn't wander through the woods like we did. When we got back though, we sat next to the campfire and waited for him to come back. All of a sudden, he comes lurching out of the tent and he vomits. It's obvious that he's had more alcohol than the rest of us. We ask him why he's been wandering around with the paintball gun, acting all strange like that. Then he comes up with this strange look on his face. They're locked up in the cab of the truck. Did you unlock it? We go and check the truck, enter the door code and see our paintball equipment just as we had left it before. The keys to the truck were also still hidden in a magnetic fob underneath. I get a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Isaac, what were you doing after we left? Uh, I was watching a movie on my phone, then I fell asleep, I guess. 
but weren't you walking around with the paintball gun? Did you just change jackets? Isaac said that he'd been in the tent the whole time that we'd left, and he'd been wearing that same fleeced hoodie all night. Somebody had been walking around our campsite. It wasn't Isaac. At this point, all of us are way too drunk to drive, but we decided to go ahead and pack up and go back towards my house for the night. We didn't bother packing up the tents, we just fold it with the sleeping bags and everything in it, we jump in the F-150 and drive out. As we approach the hump in the road, we can see that there's something grey blocking our path. The metal barrier that had been lying in the woods earlier is now on its stand. By this point, all of us have sobered up to the situation. Nobody wants to get out of the car and move the barrier. Now I did have a metal guard on the F-150, so I slowly drive forward, tapping the metal barrier with the front of my truck, and it falls right off, and slowly we drive over it. We're terrified that it was going to pop one of the truck's tyres, and that is it, we'd be done for, not able to drive anywhere, but luckily it didn't. As we drive down the road, we see that there's a vehicle following us with its lights off. It's probably about a thousand feet behind us, but we keep catching glimpses of it in the moonlight as it's reflecting off the front mirror. I start to drive as fast as I can on the forest service road. The other vehicle keeps its pace. It doesn't get any closer though, it just stays one or two turns behind us. We only see it when the road then straightens out. After about 45 minutes of speeding along gravel roads, we make it back to the main paved road. I start to drive everybody back home, but I decide that it's best to go a different way, just to be safe. I still have no idea what to make of that night even to this day. Two thousand and eight, Northern Ohio. My cousin invites me to go camping on a trip to see some hidden state park or whatever, and I happily agree because hey, Ohio has to be better than Indiana, right? So I drive out to their house, and we pack up our tent and food and head out to his truck for a few hours into the boondocks. After miles of twists and turns, the road gets bumpy and I wake up and we're off the grid, like dirt road and grass off the grid. We park the truck and head up into the hills for a couple of miles and make base camp at the top of a hill, looking out onto a valley with thick trees on the edges across from us. Nightfall comes fast, and when we're around the fire, I ask them what the park is called. Upon hearing me, they break out into laughter and say that we're not in a park at all, but on native land, and that we were camping upon some sacred hill. I call bullshit, but they name a tribe which at the time sounded legit enough for me not to argue against it. It was 1am at this point, and we were just chatting around the fire and eating marshmallows, when out of nowhere, we hear a bone-chilling scream. We all grew up hunting, and have heard our fair share of animal calls and howls, and yet none of us could agree upon what we heard. If anything, I would say a screaming fox, or maybe a wolf because of how the howl was carried. It goes on a few more times, and our laughter soon becomes uneasy, as it appears to be getting closer to us. The fifth time we hear the scream, it sounded as if it was just coming from down the valley. We all look down in that direction, and I kid you not, out of the tree line, we see what looks like a gangly thin naked man, who from this far away seems way too tall to be normal. This thing takes off in a sprint on two legs at us, and without any hesitation, the three of us run off the hill and back into the woods towards the car. Being night, it only made the escape more terrifying. As we reach the bottom of the hill, we hear the scream again, but this time it's from where the camp was. 
none of us turn back to check nor to see if the other two are near. After the fastest two miles in my life, we get to the truck and floor it off the land to the nearest McDonald's, where we sat until dawn with no words to each other. We agreed to go back in the morning to grab our things. We do, and to our surprise, nothing had been moved or taken, which seemed weird, because if someone was trying to mess with us, they would have trashed the place or at least taken something. We drove back to my uncle's where we tried to joke about it and just move on. This stuff never bothered me until I saw my friend playing the game until dawn, and I became uneasy and how it looked like what we saw. That stuff is real, and I know it's out there. Hunting is a huge part of culture in Hawaii. Kids often learn from a very young age how to hunt. My cousin, who's in his late 20s, has now been hunting for a good 20 years of his life. He's had some strange experiences in the wilderness, but this one has always stuck with me as the weirdest one. Have you ever heard of a calling spirit? Well, you get the gist of it, and I'm sure that they exist outside of Hawaii, but they're basically like if you're somewhere in the woods or alone somewhere, if you hear somebody calling your name, you do not answer. Bad things will happen when you answer. Now I'm gonna write the story like he told me. I was around 8 years old when this happened. We had just started hunting. Me, my cousin and my uncle were hunting one evening in Wola. By the time we were done, we were about a mile away from our truck. It was about 9pm and it was very dark out. My uncle said, I'm gonna get to the truck, you kids wait here. But my cousins wanted to go with my uncle. I said, I'll wait here, you come get me, I'm not walking. I was over with walking and my cousin was like, are you sure? Even my uncle said, you sure you want to wait alone? I said, hell no, but I'm not walking, I'm gonna wait. So he said that he would be back in half an hour with the truck. Not too long after they left, I heard something moving in the bushes. Then I heard my uncle's voice, hey Kai, come on, let's go. I said, hell no, I'm not walking back. Then my uncle whistled. You know when you're out playing with other kids in the neighbourhood and your dad whistles for you to come inside, and you know when you hear that whistle that you better go faster? That's the kind of whistle it was, so I jumped up and started walking. My uncle was walking ahead of me, I couldn't see him in the bushes, but I could hear him because he's saying things like, you don't want to listen, you're going to get in trouble, then he said come on let's go down here. He wanted to go into the bushes off the path. I knew something was wrong, I said, but I thought you were going to get to the truck. Just then, I saw the headlights back in the direction we started. Then I heard my uncle's stereo blasting, the only song that he ever plays when we go hunting. I then start running like I've never run before. As I take off, it feels like there's something or some kind of weight on my backpack. I still don't know what it was to this day but I threw my bag off. I then run up to my uncle's truck and he says, where's your stuff? I point back to where I was and say, it was following you. My uncle yells at me and we have to both get in the car and he immediately takes off. Now to this day, I don't know if it was my mind playing tricks on me. But I do know that there was something out there with me, and I was not alone. So, as a kid I lived about a hundred miles away from the nearest town, at a house without electricity or running water, which is the works in the Colorado Rockies. This place was in the absolute middle of nowhere and we frequently sought all kinds of wild animals, ranging from elk, deer, coyotes and cats. Our property, and a bunch of other neighbours' properties bordered National Forest roads, so to keep people off our road, we had to get about a mile and a half from our house, that we drove through before we reached our house. This time of year, we are the only people up there, as all the other homes are hunting cabins, long empty by this time in late winter. Now, 
This was not the type of gate that you could drive around if you forgot your key. There were tons of trees all around it, with barbed wire, ditches and such. So anyone wanting for off-road around it would basically have to build a new road around this gate. Well, one night, my mother, brother and sister and I pull up to the gate and we cannot find the key. It's gone. So one of us, i.e. me, has to walk all the way back up to the house in the pitch black to fetch the spare key and make their way back down. Now, it's recently snowed in January and it is totally dark. You can't even see your hands in front of you dark. And with the new snow, you can't hear anything either. There are a few clouds in the sky on and off to let some starlight through every once in a while. But it's dark. And of course, there isn't a flashlight either. So off I go. First, you walk through around 200 meters of trees. Then it opens up to a huge meadow, which then narrows back down again to trees for another 200 meters, and then opens up again into another huge meadow, which on the other side of is our house. I set out and everything seems fine. I'm just irritated that I have to do this. I'm about 15 years old at the time and a little angsty teen that is peeved off at the slightest chore. I was not thinking about my surroundings in the slightest, but as I'm walking, I get that feeling that I'm being watched as I'm halfway through the first meadow. That deep, creepy dread that something is right behind you and you can't see what it is, made it a thousand times worse by the lack of light and lack of being able to hear. My first instinct was to run, but I knew that if there was something, I was just going to provoke it. So I kept going and then stopped to try and listen as I heard a crunch echoing my footsteps. Holy shit. This time I walked a little faster and I knew there was something behind me. It was probably a cat as well. So I just kept walking right into the second bunch of trees before it opened up into a meadow. I could see our house. I could feel the pressure. At this point, we were predator and prey and I could feel the breath on my shoes. So second clearing comes up and I know what the plan is and I am about to book it. Thankfully, I'm familiar with what to do and I scream as loud as I can. As I do so, my dogs hear me and they run to chase whatever it is from behind me. They continue running past me and I book it into the house. When I get in, I grab the 12 gauge first and the key second, then pick up the tractor keys and jump in. There was no way I was going to walk that again. As I'm driving back towards the gate, I see the dogs running back. At least they weren't hurt. That could have been extremely dangerous. I also see the tracks. I knew it was a cat. It actually started approaching me from the first meadow and was tailing me for a long time. I tell my family the whole story and I know that I'm not going to get any sleep tonight. From that day, I refuse to be out alone at night in the countryside without a weapon. On a road trip with a friend, we hiked into the trail in Colorado when even into camp so we wouldn't have to pay for a campsite. We found a little clearing by a stream. My friend set up the tent while I decided to sleep under the stars. Right as we were getting ready to sleep, another woman showed up and pitched her tent in the clearing as well. I hadn't been feeling well that day. I'm not really into the paranormal, but I had an experience about 10 years ago that I've never been able to explain. It was fall of 2006 or 7, and I was making the two hour drive home from university. 
along rural country roads in northern Minnesota. The roads along this route are paved, and ditches are well maintained. The land just off the right of way is forested. For anybody curious about which road I was on, it's Country Road 58, near Two Inlets, Minnesota. I was in a section of roadway with nice long winding turns, and it was very fun driving. It was just dark enough at the time to need headlights to see, and as I came around one of these winding turns, the beam of my headlights caught a humanoid figure standing in the long grass in the ditch, maybe 50 feet in front of my car. As my car turned and my light shone on it, the thing strode gracefully but quickly the 20 or 30 feet into the woods just off the right of way. This thing was at least seven feet tall, taller than a normal man but standing naturally erect, definitely not an animal on its hind legs. It was grey with no hair and very thin, thin enough to see its joints, similar to that stereotypical grey alien type figure. It walked so quickly and gracefully, I'd never seen anything like it. Wildlife typical to that area include bear, deer, rabbits and the occasional wolf, but I can't think of anything that explains what I saw. After I saw the thing, I contemplated turning the car around to have another look or maybe just find some tracks, but I was in full on freak out mode, so I just kept driving. I was pretty shaken up when I made it home. I'll state for the record that I am a Christian and that I've tended to wonder if I saw some kind of demon or evil spirit. From the feeling it gave me, I certainly don't feel that I saw an angel. A buddy and I were hiking at dawn during a camping trip. We're walking along a path and I hear a zing like a bird chirp by my ear. A second or so later, a tree kind of pops next to my buddy. It's at this point that there was an accompanying crack and we'd realised that we'd been shot at. We informed the park ranger around noon and he ended up finding an old guy hunting illegally. Not sure if he was charged with anything, but I have no idea why he was shooting that close to us. There were no animals near us. Why would they be? They'd all be scared of us. I was camping on land associated with the Anasazi, long dead Pueblo Indians that very few people know anything about. This was when I was a boy scout. We hiked for a few days and we saw black bears every day. It's normally a somewhat unusual sight and freaked out the adult leaders and caused us to religiously use anti-bear tactics like bear bags. Not totally related to the story, but it slowed us down which led us to the events here. Anyway, we camped in a wood cabin at the bottom of a plateau, and the local rangers told us a bunch of spooky camp stories about the plateau and its relation to the long dead Anasazi people. Even their real names is lost to history, as Anasazi is what the Navajo called them, meaning ancient enemies or those who are not us. Another part of what they told us that stands out is that the Anasazi were obsessed with ravens and possibly crows as well, and a lot of their superstition revolved around massive raven people and people with raven heads, stuff like that. I completely forget all the other details at this point, as it was well over a decade ago. Anyway, my tent mate is a bit slow and is also very allergic to peanuts. He ends up eating some of the prepackaged food that contains a copious amount. That combined with the ongoing poor planning, fear of bears and sloppy leadership 
causes the adults to decide to camp out on the plateau rather than keep going. On this scout ranch, you're only supposed to camp outside the designated areas and never on the particular plateau, just because of the geography and the environment. But forget the rules, because we do anyway. We set up camp, eat, lay the bear bag, and head off to sleep. That night though, was the craziest thing. I could hear so much thunder, and so could my tent mate, but absolutely no rain, like insanely loud. My tent mate and I were terrified. It could have been heat lining, but it sounded impossibly close. We're terrified. He, the braver one of the two, actually goes out to check. As he opens the flap, I see the forest behind him. He comes back a few minutes later, and the thunder pretty much stops at the same time. He looks at me, and goes to bed without saying anything at all. It's not unusual in itself. He could be pretty slow and non-social, and likely had mild autism in hindsight. But the next day, we wake up and a ton of things popped red flags. Firstly, our tent is facing an open field, which is very strange, because yesterday we both saw Forrest from when he left the tent to check. Second, no one else heard lightning that night, except for us, which was absolutely crazy as it was loud enough to wake everyone on earth. Remember how my tent mate checked out the thunder as well? Well, he had no recollection of what he saw. He woke up confused, saying that the last thing that he remembered was just stepping outside. The good part though, the guy in the tent next door brought this up before we did. He also decided to get up and check it out, and he claims that when he stepped out of the tent, there were no trees anywhere. Just extremely long, tall pole objects almost as if there were thousands of stilts. When he looked up, he also said that there was no lightning visible, but it was super bright, full moon on steroids bright. He also claimed that he had seen flying, winged, pitch black objects, bigger than cars, and they looked like they had wings on them, and that they were round. He dove back inside and doesn't remember going to sleep or the noise going away. Remember the giant raven myths? I did, and I was scared shitless. I wouldn't have believed him if I hadn't have seen the trees and heard the thunder for myself. When I was camping 30 years ago with my grandfather, we were both falling asleep in the tent. I was notorious for having these night terrors about hearing sounds of monsters around us. So on this one particular night, as we were camping, I had just sat. I woke up and screamed to my grandfather saying that I can hear them, they're all around us. My grandfather woke up to comfort me, but then he went quiet. He quickly poked his head outside of our tent. He grabbed me by my arm. He said we're getting out of here now. As soon as I got my head out of that tent, I could smell the fire. Turns out there was a huge forest fire only meters away from where we were camping at. Had I have not woken up, we would have easily been killed. Hello everyone, thank you for watching. I really hope you all enjoyed this video. Special thank you and shout out to my friend Maltis Media for featuring. Again, I really appreciate it, my friend. It's always a pleasure to work with you. You did a really good job on these narrations, like always. Make sure you go and subscribe to him because he has really good content. Also, he's going to be uploading the second half to our collab on his channel, so make sure you go and check that out too. I'll leave a link in the description, and leave a comment saying Insomniac sent you here. Thank you everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video, like always. I'm about to go to sleep because it's 3 in the morning and this is going up at 6 in the morning because my computer crashed but I still wanted to get the video up. So have a great day everybody and take care of yourselves. Good night.